Welcome to your ETF Edge, your go-to place for everything exchange-traded funds. I'm Leslie Picker, in today for Bob Pisani. With markets coming off a topsy-turvy week on Wall Street, questions abound about the resiliency of the consumer in light of Delta. That's led to a significant repricing of the growth risk with big banks like Goldman Sachs and Bank of America Merrill Lynch downgrading their outlooks for the third quarter as companies reassess the strength of the reopening. So far, retail earnings going strong, but investors are finding it harder to ignore the slowdown in high-frequency data, softer retail sales, consumer sentiment, and home builder sentiment, plus growth concerns in China and abroad. Joining me now to break it all down is Brian Lake, head of America's ETF client at J.P. Morgan Asset Management, and Todd Rosenbluth, senior director of ETF and mutual fund research at CFRA, and Tina Herrera, chair of the YWCA board of directors. Brian, what's happening here because we are seeing so much kind of differing data you've got the high frequency data telling you one thing you've got kind of more the macro data telling you something else it feels like we're at this inflection point where the cases are rising yet more people are getting vaccinated and of course with the Pfizer full approval of its vaccine seems to be like it would be some good news for the reopening trade what's your sense yeah, you're right. We, we, we are at an inflection point here, but I think it's important for us to kind of look for the signal through the noise. Uh, and when we take a step back, we can see that um, the, the, the data does continue to get uh, better. Maybe we're at a little bit of a pause here, uh, but I do think that there's a great opportunity for the reopening trade to be on. Obviously, today we're seeing the markets uh, reflect that as well. Uh, I think what, what investors are really doing is they're, they're really focusing on valuations. Uh, they're going to be looking at um, quality, uh, balance sheets, making sure that they understand the companies that they own, maybe looking more towards some value names versus, versus some of the, the, the growth names. Uh, but we do think that there's an opportunity for investors to continue to participate uh, in the reopen trade through, uh, through the end of the year. Todd, you hear, uh, you know, the term investors focusing on valuation. I'm sure a lot of, uh, you know, schooled financiers out there would find that to be a, a, a nice relief given what we've seen recently. Um, do you believe that to be the case, especially with, you know, the potential for some tapering activity? Does all of that kind of produce grounds for more of a value trade to come back into focus on a more sustainable basis? We think so. So much of the first half of 2021 value outperformed growth and the pure or more focused value oriented strategies did even better. Growth returned uh, over the summer, but we, we think we're going to see a rotation again back towards value oriented ETFs, whether they're the broad market ones like the iShares Russell 1000 value ETF or the more targeted and focused ones. So Invesco has an S&P 500 pure value ETF, RPV. iShares has a focused value ETF, FOVL. Those really outperformed because of the strength of financials and some of the more value-oriented value and cyclical sectors. We think that's going to happen as we make our way into, the, into a return to school and a return to work for many people. Brian, do you think that the factor-oriented ETFs are kind of the way to go right now, or is it better for investors to be sector-specific? Uh, are there other types of characteristics that you would advise when looking at investing in ETFs, given this kind of uncertain, uh, unchartered territory we're in right now? Yeah, you know, um, I, I think it's also an opportunity to look at active ETFs. And, and I know that we haven't spent as much time uh, talking about active capabilities delivered through the ETF vehicle over the years. but. Uh, now we think that's that's something uh, that's going to come to the forefront of investors' minds. Um, dispersion between returns is going to be uh, more pronounced given all the uncertainty that, that you've talked about. Uh, and so investors looking to get outcomes through active strategies is, is really a way that they can enhance their portfolios. Um, we're obviously looking at doing uh, delivering some of our uh, active strategies through the ETF wrapper, uh, one that's been very popular lately where investors are really enhancing their their income on their portfolios is equity premium income. The ticker is JEPI. Uh, this is an actively managed equity uh, strategy where the underlying holdings are all quality names. Uh, but then we're doing covered call overwrite on that to generate income uh, for investors that are really in an income starved world. So um, active is maybe a way to be thinking about that. Of course, yes, uh, factors are important. Uh, as Todd pointed out, uh, the value factor is something that uh, investors are looking at as well as quality. Uh, we offer single factor strategies, uh, JVAL, G, J V A L, uh, and JQA, J Q U A. 
uh, being the tickers there. And again, those are ways to uh, isolate uh, portfolios and tactically overweight uh, some of those factors that may uh, be able to identify some of those valuations or those quality balance sheets that uh, uh, investors will benefit from uh, as we as we go in towards the end of the year and, and participate in this reopen trade. Interesting. Very quantitative uh, in nature there. Switching gears, JP Morgan just announced a string of mutual fund to ETF conversions earlier this month. That follows a pattern of similar conversions earlier this year, including Guinness Atkinson in March, dimensional funds in June. As more funds are choosing to shed the mutual fund moniker and embrace the ETF model instead. So what are the biggest factors driving this sudden rise of actively managed ETFs? And will we see this trend continue into 2022? Brian, is this a, a matter of tax efficiency? Is this a matter of fee potential? You know, what are some of the key drivers here? Well, we, we, we think investors are looking to get exposure to the market through a number of different vehicles. So whether it's mutual funds, separately managed accounts, uh, or exchange traded funds. Um, certainly, the ETF does offer some, some features to uh, investors, uh, the ability to trade throughout the day. Uh, in the instance of these, uh, these strategies that we will be converting uh, pending board approval uh, in the early part of, of, of next year, these will be 100 percent transparent um, strategies. And at the point of conversion, we actually will also be lowering uh, the overall expense ratios on uh, these, these portfolios. And so um, we do think that there's a client behavior uh, point to be made here as well. Uh, if you look at 40 Act assets, so mutual fund and ETF uh, across the U.S., now 25% of those assets are invested uh, in exchange-traded funds. 88% of financial advisors across the U.S. use uh, ETFs in, in, in their portfolios. And so, um, you know, we're just being really thoughtful. Uh, we're being very uh, client-focused as far as what our plans are. Uh, but we have announced the intention to convert these four mutual fund strategies uh, into ETFs pending board approval uh, in the early part of next year. And we think that this is a good out outcome for investors uh, for all the reasons that we mentioned, the benefits of active management uh, delivered through uh, the, the ETF vehicle, which offers a lot of features for uh, investors. We think it's a, it's a win-win. Todd, what do you think this means for the mutual fund product? I mean, Brian made a really good case as to why this conversion is necessary and, and beneficial for clients. Uh, you know, what does that do to mutual funds? Well, we're seeing investors rotating away from actively managed equity mutual funds and rotating either to index-based equity ETFs, which they've been doing for years, or actively managed ETFs, uh, actively managed equity ETFs in particular. They're punching above their weight this year. They've got about 9% of the overall flows to the equity space, as opposed to just 2% of the assets. And we're seeing it in a couple of different ways. We're seeing Firms that are new entering the ETF market, like a firm like Horizon Kinetics that launched an inflationary beneficiary ETF, INFL, that's been very popular, launched this year and is over $600 million in assets. We're seeing firms that are doing semi-transparent structures. Fidelity launched in a Magellan version of uh, – semi-transparent version of Magellan. And then we've got the fully transparent products like Brian's talking about with J.P. Morgan. And we've got a couple others that are lined up, Federated announced. Their plans to be uh, launching ETFs in probably in 2022, and we're waiting on Capital Group, uh, which has said they're going to be coming to market with actively managed equity ETFs in 2022. So that, that those are some big players entering into the ETF marketplace and shifting away from their only focus on mutual funds. Now, it's interesting, uh, Todd, just to follow up on that, it sounds almost like an oxymoron, active ETF, uh, because historically we've thought of ETFs as this kind of passive product. How frequently are these active managers trading with ARC, which is kind of the most well-known example, perhaps, of an active ETF strategy? They're trading quite frequently. Uh, is that the same to be expected for uh, a lot of the names that you just mentioned? So, right, ARC is doing things that where they're fully transparent and there's discretionary and there's trades happening every day that they're buying and selling uh, based on what's happening in the market and what they what's happening to some of their favorite stocks. These strategies, like what J.P. Morgan uh, has launched and, and plans to convert, as well as what we expect from American funds, what we what it currently exists from Fidelity, these are more buy and hold longer term investment strategies. So there isn't as much risk in front running because of the nature of the investment strategy, moderate turnover. So the manager can still make the trades they want to. 
but they can react to the marketplace. You know, we, we have big news today with the Pfizer vaccine that is likely causing active managers to make discretionary decisions that you wouldn't find within a S&P 500 index-based ETF. Huh. It's all so fascinating and, and definitely something we should be watching, especially given the amount of assets that are flowing into these categories. Uh, moving gears or switching gears, uh, the nation will be ce celebrating Women's Equality Day this week, a day that will commemorate women's suffrage and equal rights. And the impact shares YWCA, Women's Empowerment ETF, ticker WOMN, will be celebrating its three-year anniversary on Friday. That fund is up 17 percent this year and 68% since inception. What's behind that fund success? It's remarkable. Let's ask Tina Herrera, chair of the YWCA Board of Directors. Tina, what exactly does your fund look for in making investments, and why do you think it's been able to produce such strong return numbers thus far? Thank you, Leslie. Um, this is a really excellent question. Um, for those who do not know, the YWCA has been involved in women's empowerment issues for 160 years. We've partnered with Impact Shares to create this social investment fund that allows us to really do a detailed screening of those that are included in the fund itself. So we use almost 20 different filters to evaluate companies on the environment that they're creating to empower women. Having that level of rigor um, almost, I don't I hate to use the word guarantee, but we certainly provide some assurance that the companies that are involved, the over 200 companies that are involved in the ETF are doing the right thing to empower women. And as we know, companies that have a focus this intently on their workforce tend to be very well run and do well in other places. How active are you with the companies you invest in in ensuring that they meet your um, standards and meet your thresholds for investing? Is it one of those things where if they do something that you believe isn't furthering women empowerment, then you just sell the equity? Or do you have an active dialogue with management to try and um, effectuate some changes there? Right. So this, this platform gives us that opportunity to engage companies in just the way that you're saying, Leslie. Um, it's very important that, as we know, things do change over time. And since ETFs, um, in this case, they're evaluated and rescreened on an annual basis, things can happen during the year. And we do have an active um, filter that continues to run to look at when there are um, things in the news that could be Indica indicative that things have changed at that company. It does provide an opportunity for us to engage with them and help them through situations that may not be the best for women. And Todd, we've seen just this huge rise in ESG and gender diversity um, ETFs and, and ways that investors have been playing these tremendous amount of net inflows into these categories over the last year or so. Uh, how does this tie into that broader conversation? More of the assets are in these broad, diversified ESG products that cover all three of the pillars, environmental, social, and governance, where the more narrowly focused products focused on women's equality or gender diversity, those tend to be less popular, but not for the right reasons, in our opinion. So WONM, uh, I'm sorry, WOMN, uh, the ETF we're talking about, has actually outperformed the Russell 1000 in the past year. Uh, she, which is the Spider SSGA Gender Diversity Index ETF, has also outperformed. So you can not just feel good about what you're doing, but actually add value to your overall account uh, by investing in some of these more narrowly focused ESG products. One just follow-up question on that front, Todd, is that there is a school of thought that, you know, these ESG products are kind of the byproduct of a bull market phenomenon. And, you know, once things do turn, if they do turn eventually, um, that people will sell these off because they've risen so much in value. Uh, do you agree with that notion? So the more broadly diversified ESG products, we don't. So those tend to have exposures that are similar to the broader market. So ESGU, which is the largest one of these products from iShares, uh, tends to have the same sector exposure towards technology, towards financials, uh, even towards energy, as you find within the Russell 1000 or the S&P 500. So they're going to perform largely in line with the broader market, but with a higher quality tilt based on its focus on some of these governance and other environmental characteristics. 
All right. Well, that does it for this week's ETF Edge. I'm Leslie Picker. My thanks to Tina, Brian, and Todd for joining us today. And thank you for watching. You can find all our latest videos right here on our website, etfedge.cnbc.com. We'll see you next Monday, same time, same place. Bob Bassani instead of me. Have a great week. Get the ABCs of ETFs with the ETF Edge newsletter, your weekly update on the hottest trends in the nearly $4 trillion market of exchange-traded funds, expert analysis, actionable ideas, and exclusive insight from host Bob Pisani. Sign up now at cnbc.com forward slash ETF Edge newsletter.